Without further ado, I asked Ken Thornburg to talk here uh, because I saw his uh, talk that he gave up at OHSU, and I was just blown away by it. It was just a really fantastic talk. He received his PhD in development of physiology and studied cardiovascular physiology as an NIH postdoctoral fellow at OHSU. And by the way, we have a nice mixture here of local and, and national speakers. And we're really pleased to have Dr. Uh, Thornburg here as a local speaker. Um, he's a principal investigator in NIH-funded studies, including maternal fetal signaling, thyroid hormones, early origin of aging in heart development, and placebo functions. Uh, he directs the NIH training program in cardiovascular transitional research. Uh, he's co-funded uh, projects with scientists in England, New, uh, New Zealand, France, Finland, and Australia. He's got a lot of credentials. Uh, what really attracted to me, he is the, uh, the head of the Bob and Charlie Moore uh, Foundation, which I think you'll, hopefully you'll mention a little bit as you're talking. And great speaker. So without further ado, Dr. Farnberg. Good morning, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here today, and I'm pleased to be able to talk to people who are interfacing with patients and making a difference in the world. This means a lot to me. I have a plan for the next hour, and my plan is to tell you everything I've learned in the last 25 years. <laughs> and I'm going to go really fast, but it isn't actually all that much. So. I want to start by thanking some people uh, before I get going. And I want to thank these people because much of the data that I will be telling you about today has come from them. First is David Barker, who is a colleague of mine, who was probably one of the most famous epidemiologists in the world. He died a year ago last August. He spent the last decade of his life coming to Portland and working half the year with us at OHSU. And he is part of the Helsinki Epidemiology Group, uh, which I joined 10 years ago myself. And the reason it's so important is because uh, birth rec medical records in uh, other countries is a lot better than it is here. And the Helsinki Group probably has the best records in the world because they go back to have medical records now starting with the fourth generation. And that means we know everything about the grandmother, the great-grandmother, the grandmother, the mother, and the child, their medical history, everything about them. And that means that we can go back and start making links about why people get disease in that population. So I owe them a great deal of thanks. The next one is the OHSU group. And there are two groups at OHSU that have been mentioned. One is the Knight Cardiovascular Institute where I direct the Center for Developmental Health, which is a basic science group. We're interested in how genes work and how uh, development is affected by the environment of genes, and particularly in nutrition. And I also work, as was mentioned, to direct the Bob and Charlie Moore Institute for Nutrition and Wellness. And I can't say enough about the courage and tenacity of Bob and Charlie Moore, who made a gift to OHSU to bring nutrition to the front. And that's been a really good for thing for the university and has allowed the university to now start spending more of its time thinking about prevention and health in addition to its treatments. And the work that I'm going to tell you about today, I want you to see on the bottom list, came from the National Institutes of Health, from five or six different institutes. And I would be derelict if I did not tell you how important those people are for supporting the work that we do to understand epigenetics and how nutrition works. So, with all those thank yous, I will start. So the first thing I want to talk about is chronic diseases and their changing prevalence. And I want to start by writing headlines that nobody's written yet. And I'm unhappy that nobody's written these because they need to be written. And the first one is that between 2010 and 2014, diabetes rates increased 4% per year in the United States. And that means that right now about 29 million people are 
diabetic, and that has changed dramatically over the years, as I'll show you. The other headline that needs to be written is that 2014 was a banner year. It was the first time in history that any states broke the record of having more than 35% of their population obese. And it turns out that Mississippi and West Virginia led the way. And might, you might want to point your finger at them, but just remember, we're right behind them. So it won't take long for us to catch up. And lastly, most people don't know about this, but uncontrolled hypertension continues to go up. It doesn't go up rapidly like the others that I've mentioned, but it's still creeping up, which means more and more people are getting hypertensive and they're not under control. And that means that more of these people will suffer heart disease later. I'll show you data now. In the upper left, you'll see the percentage of the population in Oregon who are obese. And you'll notice that in 1989, it was about 14%. And you'll notice that in 2007, it was about 28%. So it doubled in that period of time. If you look to the lower right, you'll see that uncontrolled hypertension crept up between 1988 and 94 when it was about 38%. Now in 2004, it was about 42%. Now the interesting part of that is during that time, several new drugs were available and there was easier for people to control their blood pressure than it's ever been yet the numbers continue to creep up. There are many reasons for that, but I just want to make the point that it shows something very profound. And that is, in this graph, you'll see the increase in the percentage or the actual number of people with type 2 diabetes. Now, I want to start by showing, you won't be able to see the numbers from the back, but this goes from 1958 to 2010. So in 1958, how many people remember 1958? Oh, that's pretty good. So I remember 1958, um, I was in junior high school, and I didn't know a single person who had diabetes. Because less than 1% of the population had it, and it wasn't something anybody talked about, it was just rare. But you'll notice that starting with that 1%, it started creeping up, then about 1997, it was about 3%. So that slow creep happened over that period of time, and then in the mid-90s, at the same time that the obesity epidemic began that we started to notice, you can see a very steep incline in the number of people who had diabetes. And as you'll remember the headline I told you just a minute ago, that over the last four years we've crept off the 2010 curve and the CDC hasn't made us a new graph yet, so I just drew the arrow sticking out over the top. And what you'll see there is that over the last four years, it's gone up by 4% every year. And we're now just almost at the edge of 30 million people having it. Now, the CDC is predicting that one in three people will be diabetic by 2050 in the United States, if that, if that particular trend continues. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because, like I said, I'm a cardiovascular guy. That's what I study, cardiovascular disease primarily and some other diseases. And you'll notice that obesity, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension are all powerful risk factors in determining whether people have cardiovascular disease. Now, there's a mistaken idea in our society, and it's driven by fact. This mistaken idea is driven by fact. The fact is that since 1968, heart disease rates have been going down in the United States. I mean, deaths from heart disease have been going down and they've dropped by some 70%. So that's pretty amazing. The problem is that the underlying issues that cause heart disease have been going up. So you can be misled by thinking that we're getting healthier because fewer people are dying from heart disease, when the truth of the matter is that the health of the US population is worsening, and it's been worsening at a dramatic rate since the mid-90s. So I just want to know, have I cheered you up at all so far? <laughs> So it now costs 1 .3, between 1 and $1.3 billion a day just to take care of people who have heart disease, not counting the other diseases. And that money is very, that, that amount is very uh, difficult for us to bear already, and we're expecting that to go up. So now I'm going to show you a series of graphs, and these graphs will have two maps of the United States, one that shows you the 
the uh, percentage of people who are obese, and another one, the percentage of people who have diabetes. And you can see from the key there, I'll just give you a, few, few, a, a way to get oriented, because then I'm going to rush through some graphs. This pulled off my shirt. I just want to show you um, what you can see on how this works. First of all, all the white states means that they, they're missing data because in 1994 the CDC didn't have cooperation from all the states. And some states like Oregon, you know, we're pioneers, we're on our own, we don't send our data to anybody. So the same was true for diabetes back then and only some of the states were known. So here's the key. When you see red, Medium red, it's 22 to 25%. When you see dark red, it's 26% for obesity. And when you see the dark red on the diabetes graph, that means 9% um, of people have. It. So now I'm going to let the computer walk you through these dates. There's 94. There's 96. There's 98. There's 2000, there's 2002, there's 2004, there's 2006, there's 2008, there's 2009, there's 2010. In 2010, you can see all the states that had more than 26% of their population that was obese. And now I'll show you some updates on those. Here's the 2000 date with all of them, so it goes above 26%. And you can see that there are a number of states in the South who are already at the 30% level. And if you look at the new graph in 2012, this has been recalculated with new colors. You can see now that they're in the over 30%. And the two states, Mississippi and West Virginia, are states that just this year crossed 35%. So this is going to be expensive. Here in this graph shows you in 2015 how much money we were spending, over $350 billion a year. I already told you about that. But what you have to see is the rate at which this is expected to increase. And you can see in about 14 or 15 more years that number is going to double. Now my, this is my private view. There's not a written document of this. But it's my view is that we cannot afford as a society to double the cost of heart disease. There's not enough money to keep adding heart to take care of people who have cardiovascular disease because it's too expensive. And if we're going to do that, we have to find another way to deal with the problem. So now I'm going to change, change tracks just a little bit to ask you something about why this might be occurring. And I'm going to spend the rest of my talk talking to you about why we have seen this increase in disease rates and what is it that we can do about it as local people. So first of all, I'm going to ask you if you think that everything you saw in those maps and those changes could be genetic. So you have to ask yourself, could it be genetic? Well, one way to do that is to look at the maps. And look at these maps. Here's where the dark red is the highest number of people who died of heart disease. And up this, the dark red is about 800 per 100,000. Here is the stroke deaths. The dark purple are people who have died of stroke. Here's the number of adults who have diabetes, and you can see the ge geographic distribution. Here's the people who have obesity. You've already seen that graph. And here's one you haven't seen before. Here's the people who have suffered depression. And this depression, now you have to ask, why is it that there are geographic distributions that's about the same across the states? And you have to ask, well, could that be because people have bad genes? Now, if you want to make the gene argument to me, you have to argue that not only do people in the South have the bad genes for cardiovascular disease and heart deaths, they have to have bad genes for every disease that we see. So pretty soon you start to argue there's really something funny about people in the South, they all have bad genes. <laughs> so the, the gene argument doesn't hold. There are lots of other reasons it doesn't hold, and I'll just tell you one. Let's see, I'll look at heart death right there. Some of you have heard of the state, it's called Louisiana. And Louisiana, you might remember the Louisiana Purchase, which the United States bought from the French in the 19th century. 
And what you'll know about that is that there are many French communities who still like French and speak French in the South. Now, there's an interesting thing about the French genes. Those people in the South who are Cajuns, they have some of the highest heart disease in the world, and their relatives back in France have the lowest. So it's pretty interesting that since they've moved to the UNES, their genes have gone bad. So there's a lot of reasons why the genetic argument is not very powerful. So there's another way to look at this, and that is that we have disease for other reasons because they're, they're environmentally driven. That's a completely different argument, and it's one that holds power, and I want to try to explain to you why we think it is true. So the first one comes from a quote from David Barker where he said, birth weight is a powerful predictor of adult onset chronic disease, and he was the first to show it. Here, is, here are his original data. And what he's showing here is the mortality from heart disease over the birth weight scale of people born in England in the 30s and 40s. Actually, 20s, 30s, and 40s. There's 15,000 people in that graph. And you can see that men and women, yellow and black, are on approximately the same curve. And that those people who were born with a low birth weight have high risks for having, of dying of heart disease. And those that were born at the large end of the scale had very low risk for having heart disease. Well, we've learned a lot since that was published in 1989. And what we've learned is that the curve now looks something like this. These are the data I already showed you. And that means that if you were born at between 8 and 9 pounds, you have a low risk of dying of, of heart disease. But that that risk goes up as your birth weight goes down. So that a baby born at, th at 5 pounds or so or less has a three to five times higher chance of dying of heart disease than a baby born at nine pounds. And you can also see that the curve goes back up. We know it goes back up to the 10 and 10 and a half pound range. We suspect that it goes up there, and more studies are known for me to be sure to tell you that, that it's true. But we're, we're looking at that. And we also know that there are curves like this that are very similar now that explain other diseases, including type 2 diabetes, obesity, and hypertension and I'm going to show you the ones for right now for diabetes and hypertension. So here's the one for diabetes in the same population of English people. And this one's even more amazing because what it shows, the odds ratio means your risk for having diabetes is plotted against birth weight. And this was done by Nick Hales and David Barker at Cambridge University. And what they showed in that population was that babies that were born at the low end of the birth weight scale, 5.5 pounds or less, have an eight times higher risk of having type 2 diabetes than babies born at 9.5 pounds. Now, you ask any epidemiologist, name 10 things you can think of where you can have an eight, time risk, eight times risk, higher risk for having a disease. Nobody will be able to think of it, except for toxins. So it turns out that this is a very profound finding, that there's such a high risk based on how somebody grew before they were born. Here's the risk of hypertension. It's more complicated. I don't usually show this one to lay audiences because it's a little difficult to explain. And I'm going to try to explain it to you so you'll understand it. So here it is. Here's birth weight over here. Low birth weight has the highest bars. High birth weight has the lowest bars. But there's a series of bars based on how much somebody weighed when they were adults. So here's males and females that weigh, weighed the least. These are people that weigh maybe 130, 40 pounds. And you can see that if they were born with it, the lower their birth weight when they're born, the higher their risk. But their risk is up in the uh, 40 to 50% range. But you can see that people who put on weight later in their life, they have much higher risk. They have as high a risk at the large birth weight as these people do at the low birth weight. And their risks go all the way up so that some 70% of people in this category in England who were born at low birth weight and put on a lot of weight as adults have the risk for hypertension that is extremely high. Now this taught us a really important lesson. We came to realize that what birth weight does is makes you vulnerable for disease. It doesn't give you disease it makes you vulnerable. And when you become vulnerable for disease, there are second hits that happen to you later in your adult life. And those second hits are environmental circumstances 
like, like eating poor diets, putting on a lot of weight, and those build the risk that you will have disease later in your life as adults. So there's a two-prong thing. Now we have a birth weight effect, and we have now a second hit effect. Now what about birth weight in the United States? This that comes to a surprise to people. This work was done from my colleague Matt Gilman at Harvard, and what he shows is that birth weight, over the time that we have seen this high increase in obesity, birth weight has been going down in the United States, and it really doesn't matter at what gestational age delivery takes place. It's been going down in all of them. And this is a big surprise to people because as more and more women are obese, and about half the women who delivered OHSU, by the way, are obese, those women tend to have babies that are larger if their glucose is out of control. So you would expect babies to start getting larger, right? Well, the truth is there is a proportion of babies now that are getting larger because of that. But unbeknownst to us, there's even more babies that are being born smaller. And that balances out so that overall across the nation, babies are being born smaller and low birth weight, as I told you a minute ago, has its own risks. And now, 25 years later, I told you I'd tell you everything I've learned, and here's one of the things we've learned. And that is that there's complexity beyond birth weight. And there's two big features. One is, that is maternal phenotype. Maternal phenotype means how was that, how was that mother made? What was her body like? How much muscle did she have? How much fat? How tall is she? How short is she? And the other one is the placental phenotype. The way the placenta is made is dependent on the mother in part, and the placenta, which is the organ that transmits all the nutrients to the baby, is being affected by the way the mother grew. So that means that both the mother and the placenta now have in combination to be considered to understand what the risk for disease in later life. So here's the way we know it works now. One is, Here's a baby, by the way, this is an ultrasound. Here's a cross-section of the face of a baby. You're seeing the ultrasound. There's the nose, just so you can see what you're looking at. The way this baby is going to grow is dependent on how it will get its nutrients from its placenta. And it will come from two sources, the mother's diet and the mother's body. And the mother's body, because her tissue, when she becomes pregnant, starts turning over at a high rate, especially muscle and fat. And that puts the molecules of lipid and fat in the blood so that the placenta can take them up at a fast rate. So the mother and the way she, is, the way she lived as a child and the way she grew earlier in her life are now influencing the kind of baby that she can provide. Now there's an interesting part of this story we've been studying and this is the sex dependent uh, part of nutrient uptake. I thought you might get a kick out of this because we did. And that is that we discovered that boy babies and girl babies are very different on the way they take nutrients from their mother. Big surprise, right? Boys take up nutrients as fast as they can. <laughs> Girls are more conservative. They save them and they take them up slowly. Boys don't want to waste their tissue on a placenta, so they make a smaller placenta and try to build a bigger body faster by taking nutrients from their mother faster. So I can just tell you about an experiment the first time we saw it. We took a little piece of placenta, we put it in a dish with some nutrients, especially some, free, some omega-3 fatty acids, and we did the same with the girl placenta. We gave them there for a few minutes, then we checked to see how much they took up during that time. We were shocked to find that the boy took two to three times more than the girl. Then we went back and looked at the data, and we realized that that's the way boys were programmed to grow, and that boys' placenta grow so boys grow at the fastest rate they can grow, and they also are interesting because they're the most vulnerable. If the mother can't provide the nutrients that they need, then they tend to lag behind and they die more easily in the womb and as newborns. That's well known in the world of, of obstetrics. So now we can be able to make a hypothetical view of the life course. And I want to explain to you this. Here, this total bar is somebody's lifetime. And I don't know if you've counted this up, but most people live on the average now in the United States about 30,000 days. So you can look up on a calendar and see what day you're on if you want to know. <laughs> and it turns out that what we've discovered is that the first thousand of those 30,000 are the most important 
in determining your risk for disease for one very clear reason. That's the time during your life that you're most sensitive to nutrition to make your organs in a healthy way. That's all there is to it. The way you need nutrients to make organs, if you make your organs well, you'll be healthier for the rest of your life. So we can show the relative sensitivity to nutrition over your lifetime is very high before you're born. It's even before you're implanted as an embryo and it decreases over your lifetime with a little blip on the end toward elderly because nutrition has a lot to do with elderly health as well. So now I want to talk to you about transgenerational effect. And I just want to say this, that now where you've gone, I hope you've gone in your mind, you've gone from knowing the disease, you've gone to knowing that birth weight's important. Now that you're seeing that the mother's body and her diet is important, and now you're going to, I want you to know that this is important across the generations. I'll try to explain that to you. So now for you academic types, here's the way it works. Here's maternal role in programming. And I want you to know that we're discovering a larger paternal effect. It's not the same as maternal. It has different ways. It's epigenetic. I'll tell you a little bit about it later. And if I forget, you can ask me. But there is a paternal effect, and I don't want to leave men out. They have some role in the world. <laughs> the truth is that maternal influence is powerful, and there's two effects. There's the 100-year effect, and there's the 1,000-day effect. And I'm just going to go back. I'm going to go back to show you that's the first thousand days. That's from the time of conception through two years of life. So there's a thousand day effect. There's a hundred year effect I'm going to tell you about in a minute. We know the maternal infect is her body, her physiology, her diet, and her social stress. And social stress is a big one. All of these things put together decide what kind of placenta is going to be made with some paternal gene influence. And that affects fetal nutrition. How much nutrient does the baby get? How much oxygen? How many hormones? How many stress molecules came from the mother? And cytokines that affect the way the placenta works. That leads to a fetal outcome, which we call a, phen a phenotype. And included in the fetal outcome are birth weight, ponderal index, that's uh, weight for length, organ structure, and epigenetic profile. That's what the baby is like. And all of these affect the systems that make the baby healthy or not. And these include the immune system, oxidative stress, stem cells, inflammation, and the neuroendocrine in the brain that will run your hormones later in your life. These all then decide on how vulnerable the offspring has been by following this down through this pathway to offspring vulnerability. So vulnerability by the time you're born is already huge. And it can still be influenced, especially in the first two or three years after life. Then this goes to a second hit, and there are many things that can happen during a second hit that can lead to disease. These second hits include your diet as an adult, the rate at which you age, which is partly stress dependent, social cues, exercise, too much or too little, stress, hormones, and toxins in the environment. So now let me explain the 100-year effect, how it works. If you look in the upper right corner, there's a young woman talking on a telephone with a cord. And that means it was a while back. And it turns that she's talking on the telephone, and in her womb is this baby. And this baby girl has a womb. She has a uterus and ovaries. And she is going to become this woman who will bear this baby. Now, the baby that she's making here came from an egg that was made when she was this big, and it was made inside her ovary and nourished by her mother. So her mother's diet actually influenced the development of that egg, plus her reproductive organs, including the uterus and the bladder and all the blood vessels set up in glandular anatomy of her uterus, was set by her mother's by this baby's grandmother's nutrition. So that's the 100-year effect. So let me tell you my own personal example, which I like to do. I'm in my 60s. My mother is in her, her 90s. I've been away for two weeks, so I haven't seen her, but she's doing well. She's 92. And the egg that made me was made in my 92-year-old now mother when she was 
a fetus in my grandmother's womb, and the egg that made me was almost exactly a hundred years ago. So I'm a hundred, and that hundred year life I've had has been dependent on my grandmother's nutrition, on my mother's nutrition, on my childhood nutrition, and now on my nutrition as an adult. So this transgenerational effect is what we call transgenerational nutritional flow, and that means that nutrition flows from generations to the next and make a lot of difference on what kind of person will be born from it. So what does malnutrition look like? That's the next thing we have to ask. And I'm going to ask this for a question in Oregon. Well, there are many phenotypes of, of bodies of women who give birth to babies, and luckily most of them are in the healthy range. But it turns out that I'm just going to show you the extremes. Here's a very thin woman who wants to be a model. I know a lot about these indirectly because my wife was a sixth grade school teacher for almost 20 years and she had girls in her class like this every year and they all wanted to be thin. They didn't like to eat because they somehow thought that they were going to be more beautiful by being so and they didn't develop their muscle. This girl has no muscle and no fat. And remember I told you when you're pregnant that you have to have, if you're a woman pregnant, you have to have muscle and fat to turn over to provide amino acids and free fatty acids that the baby's placenta can take up to make the baby. Here's another kind of woman who's got high calorie malnutrition. Remember that word, high calorie malnutrition. You might look at a person like that and say, well, that person's not malnourished, but the truth is they're terribly malnourished. They have too much fat and they don't have good nutritional balance. And because of that, they tend baby, they give birth to babies like I've already told you that are very small or have a lot of fat on their body, depending on their glucose control. So we have studied these at OHSU, and we can tell you that the normal distribution of birth weight does not fit these people. They're born more often in one of those two categories. But these two babies have something in common. They have poor lipid profiles. Their livers are born abnormal. And if it's born in a small baby, their livers will be small and will have a hard time managing their cholesterol later so they'll tend to have high LDL cholesterols and other fatty lipids that make them vulnerable for heart disease. They will have increased appetite, and I'm going to tell you about that in a minute, because their brain has been rewired. They will not only have increased appetite, but their oxidative stress systems will be depressed, and therefore the endothelium, the cells that line blood vessels, will become vulnerable, and they will lay down plaque in their coronary arteries or in their brain, and more likely to have strokes or to have heart attacks. So they have this vulnerability for one reason, they were born malnourished. And this malnourishment is a word we need to use because people understand it and they usually apply it to kids who have really been cheated in life by having, not having enough food in childhood. But the truth is we have malnourished population and that's the reason we have more disease. Now there's another piece you need to know about this that gets increasingly complicated and like I said I don't always say all this to the lay audience but here is the human embryo and the cells around the outside of this embryo are called trophoblast cells, that's the trophectoderm, the inner cell mass is the embryonic stem cells. These cells become the baby's body, these cells become the placenta. Now an interesting thing happens if you can remember your reproductive biology. Reproductive biology is interesting because what happens is that once a month an egg is shed by an ovary in a normal reproductive woman, either one ovary or the other, and it travels down the, the oviduct or the fallopian tube until it, it gets to the body of the uterus. Now the interesting part is during the seven to ten day journey, the embryo is developing. And during that developmental period, it is bringing in, it is sensing the nutrients of the mother already, and it's making decisions. If you can think like an embryo, you're thinking, ah, this mother doesn't have very much nutrient. I'm going to alter the way I grow so that I'll have a better chance of survival. So if the mother is low on nutrients because of her body or her diet, then that will change the way the, develop, the embryo will develop. And even in an animal study, even if the, once that is implanted, if the mother has a perfectly nutritious diet from then on, the offspring will have hypertension and heart disease later just from that single journey down the oviduct. 
And we know now that that's true, and that means that the nutrition of a woman is important before she ever knew she was pregnant, and that her body is already providing signals to her future baby. So now, during fetal life, here's what we can say about it. We now know that there are three main stressors that change the way babies grow. One is nutrition. I've been talking about it already, poor nutrition in particular. There's low oxygen, and there's maternal stress. All three of those are very powerful in determining how a baby grows. And if those happen in a particular window of time, the effect on the baby will depend on where it is in its gestational development. So here is an embryo, a fetus, a birth along this scale in time from conception. And you can see that there's a preconception period which can affect the heart. I've already mentioned that. But then there are two areas of that there are two periods of development when the heart is especially affected by one of these stressors. Cardiogenesis when the heart is being made, or heart cell maturation. And if malnourishment hurt occurs there or there, there will be different reasons that the heart will then be likely to be malnourished. And that means that the pan if there's a stress that comes right down from that arrow, the brain, or certain region of the brain, the placenta, the pancreas in making insulin, the nef number of nephrons in the kidney, and the heart cell will all be affected by that because that's the time when those organs are most sensitive because of the way they're in their developmental phases. So these developmental phases are really important. So early knife nutrition drives risk for later disease by altering system structures in the baby, the physiology, and through epigenetics. And now I want to tell you a little about that. So let's talk about wiring of the brain. Here's an example. Those of you who have studied the brain know that there are these neurotransmitters that are really important. And the amount of those transmitters is determined on what kind of nutrition the brain has during its development, during those first thousand day period. And it turns out that poor nutri nutritional, low birth weight, poor nutritional uh, intake by the mother increases postnatal energy take after birth. And that means that babies that are born small because they've been malnourished are hungrier than other babies. Their brain is wired for it and they're wired long-term hungry. And that increase, they take in more energy, that increases their plasma glucose, and that lays down more fat mass in adolescence, and this is what we call catch-up growth. This is, can be shown in a mouse, a rat, a rabbit, a sheep, a guinea pig, a, every farmer knows about it. A lot of people who raise dogs and cats know about that. The runts, Sometimes people are really proud that the runts end up being bigger than the animals that develop more. Why is that? Because they have more appetite, they eat more, and they put on more fat. Unfortunately, they're less healthy. They're less healthy because they have less muscle. And having less muscle means they can't handle glucose as well, and they're more likely to have a problem. So people who are born through and have catch-up growth, have their central nervous system requires them to have a higher appetite, and we need to have a lot of compassion for these people because they have a different kind of food drive than the rest of us. Now, what does that have to do with their risk? There's a childhood effect, and that is that you can see that here's the, the body mass index over age, and you can see that there are ranges of people who have different risks for having diabetes. So here's one growth pattern. Here's a growth pattern where it goes up the BMI goes up like this by the age of two, and then it goes down again, and then it starts up at the age of four and keeps going up. And those babies that start putting on fat at the age of four have the highest risk for diabetes. Those people who then lose their weight become thin, thin as kids, and if you go look at a classroom, you'll see a lot of kids who are thin, who are at the ages five, six, seven, and eight. And those thin kids will eventually start putting on weight called the adiposity rebound. It's normal for everybody. The question is, when do you do it? And that depends on how your appetite was driven by the way you were born. And kids who postpone it and start when they're eight years old have very low risk for having type 2 diabetes later in their lives. So lastly, now I'm going to say a little bit more and then talk about epigenetics. I'm going to talk a little bit more about heart disease, the three processes that cause cardiac death. 
So those of you who are medical people all know about this. The one is an occluded coronary artery. We call it a myocardial infarction because there's a, an occlusion of a coronary artery which stops blood flow to a region of the heart, and that's the most common cause. The second one, which is becoming more common now, is called heart failure, and that's because the heart is too weak to eject the blood or because the blood can't get into the heart during diastole fast enough to fill properly. So either one of those cause heart failure, and those heart failure can lead to death. And the last one is called sudden asynchronous excitation or sudden cardiac death, and that can occur because the heart is electrical abnormal and it starts to fibrillate, and therefore the, it, the muscle cells are beating out of coordination and it can't beat at, to, to eject blood. Now all three of these processes are programmed, and by programming what I mean is they're set by their early developmental cause. And I'm going to give you one example of it and show you how the placenta and the mother both affect it. So here's a table which shows the risk of having heart failure as an adult. And again, we're back in Helsinki to get this data. And what it shows is that here's the mother's height. There are short mothers and tall mothers. And here's the placental area. So what this shows is that in short mothers, there's a two to three times higher risk if the baby had a small placenta compared to a baby that had a large placenta. So placenta size makes a big difference on the risk for having heart failure only if the mother was short. It has no meaning in tall mothers at all. Now this is true for all the causes of heart disease, not, and every one of them has a different combination of placental size and mother size that predict the disease. We don't understand it completely, but what we do know is that the mother's body composition at the time she is pregnant has a lot to do with the kind of placenta that she's able to make, and therefore her nutritional history that goes all the way back to her grandmother and great-grandmother are important in determining what kind of biological history she will have. So we now know that women who get strokes, and this is true for men too, had low birth weight. They grew very slowly in childhood, abnormally slowly, and they had, their mother did the same thing. They had, their mother grew slowly, and this slow-growing mother that passed it on to their offspring have higher risk for stroke. And by the way, Oregon has a high risk for stroke compared to all the states surrounding us, and we don't know why that's true. Secondly, the risk of, of a heart attack or cardiovascular disease is also a, birth, a low birth weight effect, but in this case, it's getting fat in early childhood. And in that case, also an abnormal placental size. An abnormal placental size underlies every form of heart disease that we've ever been able to find. So what I'm telling you now is just to help you understand the biology of what we've learned. We don't understand all of it, but we understand a lot more than we did five years ago. That's how fast it's moving, and I think that will help us get to the matter. Now I want to talk about the foods that matter. We tell pregnant women, to eat these foods every day, whole grains, fruits and vegetables, nuts, legumes, and pulses. We think it's important that they have balanced diets and we want them to, we want them to change their diet so that they enjoy these food groups and we want it to be very, very, very simple. We don't want to have complicated formulas that people have to sit down and calculate. We just want principles that they can follow. And secondly, we want them to know that there are things that are not that good for them and they should eat those sparingly, if at all. And they should eat those including refined flours, sugars, enriched fructose, dairy fat, red meat, and processed foods. And so many people start understanding that this is a way that they can understand a diet change and we have a problem. And that is we tell them this, but this is what they see when they, groceries, when they go to the grocery store. Now the problem with this is there's not anything in there I don't like. So that it turns out that if we're honest about ourselves, most of us who have raised in this culture know that we already have taste preferences that are built on the food culture in which we were raised. And because of that, if we're naive about that, we can't expect people to go from the right-hand column to the left-hand column automatically. It's difficult. So that means those of us who are going to work with people in the field have to be careful and compassionate about how this can be done. I found this on the web, and I just want to tell you, it's at a website called The Daily Fork. You can look it up. It's really funny. This is one individual who I am now using as representative of every human being in the United States. 
And what this person did, and I think it was a guy, he made a chart of foods that, he, of nu how nutritious a food is versus whether he likes it or not. And he, did, he made little pictures he put in there of different foods to see whether he liked it or not. And it turns out that the food he, most of the foods he likes, here's the like end of the scale, are down here. And they have low nutritious value. Now this is his judgment, not mine. And he's pretty, he got it pretty right. I mean, some of them are a little wacky, but pretty good. Now there's some foods up here that are highly nutritious that he likes. He put a tomato and some blueberries something in some kind of a bottle that you can pour, I don't know what it is, and something else I can't identify. So th that's what he thought was nutritious, and he had some low nutritious food that he didn't like. Spam was one of them. <laughs> so it turns out that there's this relationship, and I think this is the general relationship in our whole population of people who have food preferences for food that are not very nutritious, and they don't like the foods that we all tell them are most nutritious. So we have some work on our hands to do something about this. Here is Christy Nays' chart that she has on our website at OHSU and the Moore Institute, you can get it. And this we give to pregnant women so that they can choose good foods during their pregnancy. Now lastly, I just want to give you a little bit of neuroscience that will help build your compassion level. I think those of us who want to work with the public have to have high rates of compassion with people who are in the condition that we're in. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this. One is we all have drives, and if we don't have those drives, we die. They keep us alive. We have to have an appetite. We have to be thirsty. We have to keep our temperature right. We have to be sensitive to carbon dioxide, and we have to sleep. Now, why carbon dioxide? I don't know if you know your respiratory physiology. But your breathing rate that you're doing right now is being regulated by your carbon dioxide levels. That's what determines. You breathe to keep your, your carbon dioxide at the right level. And that's a drive. You can't avoid it. Just try holding your breath for an hour. It doesn't work. <laughs> so it turns out that those are drives, and they're run by the hypothalamus and the brainstem, and they're very, very powerful. But we have another thing that's in the brain, and those are our reward centers that we call pleasures, things that make us happy because our, our brain tells us. And these include sexual activity and procreational desires, and if we didn't have them, the human race would cease. Senses, all of our senses, if they're properly stimulated, give us pleasure. Receptors from plant-derived foods that we get in our food that are endorphins and other pleasure molecules most of us enjoy eating, not only for taste, but for other reasons that they make us feel good. And by the way, a lot of people who eat really poor diets don't realize that they feel poorly all the time because those poor diets have just the opposite effect. And lastly, we have receptors in the brain for endogenous molecules that you get, uh, like endorphins, that you can get from food-like substances and from a lot of exercise. As you know, some people are hooked on exercise because they like this feeling. So it turns out that these are our reward centers, and they're run by these receptors in our brains. And unfortunately, all of these receptors can be abused by chemicals. You can take chemicals exogenously, IV or sometimes oral, and you can then get addicted to those. And then likewise, we can, come, we can get nearly addicted, or what we think is an addiction, for different kinds of food because of our reward centers. Now, what you have to know is that commercial science has taken advantage of everything I just told you. It's a hardcore science. And Michael Moss, who is a Pulitzer Prize winner, wrote an article in the February 24th issue of the New York Times Magazine, and he wrote a book called Salt, Sugar, and Fat, you might have read. And what the story is, is a very nice documentary on how the food industry has been working hard to use the science of reward systems to make us like their food. They use words like the bliss point, which the bliss point is if you eat a certain kind of potato chip and you like it and it gives you a bliss reaction, that's the most reward that you can get from food, you're going to want to have it again. And the saying in an advertisement, you can't eat just one. You can't eat just one because you want another one. There's a pleasure that's derived from it. And it's not only taste, it's also crispness, the way it crunches in your mouth. And this has all been studied. And as a matter of fact, Frito-Lay Company, he claims, 
spends $30 million a year for the chemists, psychologists, and technicians that do nothing but figure out how your brain works so that you can buy their food. And our society, we believe, we, that is now I'm talking about the scientific community that does the kind of work I do, we're completely convinced that the declining quality of the American diet because of this is the primary cause for the vulnerability of disease and it's what's happened to us since the 1990s and it's happened over the last three generations. And how do we know it works? Well, we know all about these pleasure centers and you can put somebody in, a, in an MRI and it turns out that people in Caltech have done that and they've even gone so well to tell us which foods turn on those pleasure centers by how much. So you can do functional MRI studies in an MRI machine and you can see where it turns on the pleasure centers and you can start looking now at a scientific way on how to make people pleasure. pleasure. So how does this all work and how does it change our brain? So the way it works is that the genes you inherited from your parents are determined by a code in your DNA. That's what we call genetic. But epigenetic is something else. Epigenetics are mechanisms that change the way your genes turn off and on by stimuli from the environment. They don't change your gene code, they just change the way your genes work. And it turns out that nutrition or stress environments before birth will make epigenetic changes, some of which we know are permanent, that last in that person and prevent good genes from turning on when they should and allowing others when they shouldn't. So let me give you some examples. Here's a set of identical twins. These twins are interesting because they have different fingerprints. They have the same genes, and if you took a sample from them and looked at their gene code, you couldn't tell them apart. But it turns out that they have different fingerprints, and why is that? Because they were both sharing the same placenta, and one of them got more nutrition than the other. And at week 13 to 15 is when you make all your fingerprints. And the way you make your fingerprints is determined on the rate of flow of nutrients from your mother at the time you make it. So it turns out that if you have different nutrients at that time, you have different fingerprints. And by the way, if your fingerprints are different, even if you have an identical twin, your risk for having diabetes and other diseases are different also. And secondly, let me show you another epigenetic effect. Here's two genetically identical mice. If you took a blood sample of them and looked at the genes, you couldn't tell one mouse from the other. They have the same gene. However, this mouse does not look like that mouse. It's yellow and it's fatter. And that's because it got a different diet by its mother. And that diet changed the methylation pattern of the genes. Now, let me tell you about methylation. Here's a strand of DNA. And these two little bright spots show you a place on one region of the DNA code called a cytosine that's methylated that turns off that gene from working. And that methylation process is the basis for epigenetics, including a couple of other processes that change the way DNA can be turned off and on. Methylation one is the easiest one to understand. I'm going to give it to you as an example of how we know we can now go back and look at people and see how that has worked. So here's an example of how it works. Here you can see a child fat mass. These are in nine-year-olds, 64 of them either as the actual kilograms or as a percentage of their body weight. And you can see that a, there are four bars with increasing fat mass, and that fat mass is dependent on how much one gene was methylated by their environment. And what made this methylated? In this case, this was that their mothers had very low carbohydrate intake during their pregnancy. And we've been able to see that now in the mouse, it turned out that they didn't, the mouse that turned yellow didn't have vegetables. In this case, it's low carbohydrate. And what we're now realizing is that we need a balanced diet during that pregnancy to prevent abnormal methylation of genes all across the board, whether it's in an animal or a human. There's strong evidence that good diets can reverse some of the epigenetic effects. This has been shown nicely by a group in Canada. We're working on it too. And lastly, I'm just going to say this. What you have to remember is that the community is the environment of the mother. You might think that I've been blaming mothers. I haven't. I've been explaining to you biology. That's all. And mothers are affected by the environment they live in and the environment as society that we make for people, the kind of food we eat and the expectations we have in our social group 
are what determine what people eat. And if we want to change the diets of women, we don't need to only harp on them. We have to talk about how we're going to change the culture so we all eat well. And if we don't do that, we're not going to be successful at doing much. So here are my take-home message. If you just woke up, here it is. You don't, you don't even have to know of anything else I've said. The health of the U.S. population is in rapid decline. You might have gotten that. The nutritional quality of the American diet has deteriorated over the last three generations, and it's our belief that this multi-generational effect started to take effect in about the 1990s because there was two generations before then that really made this increase at a fast rate. Poor growth before birth imports risk for disease. We know that. The fetus acquires its nutrients from maternal diet and, ma and the mother's tissue. Healthy young men and women are required to have a healthy population. That's given. And mothers provide nutrients to their fetus via tissue turnover. And just let me take a little minute to make a pitch on that. If young men and women don't have good diets, they cannot have perfectly healthy kids, even if their gene code will allow them to do it. So our young people, our kids in our schools, all those young people who will be reproductive in the future need to be building healthy bodies now, and we need to be paying attention to what they're eating and why. And lastly, a carefully designed diet of fruit, nuts, and vegetables can provide the necessary nutrients for a healthy pregnancy. And I don't, don't want you to say there's any magic secret to that. Maternal diet can contribute to the next generation through epigenetics, and I hope I've mentioned that to you, and I'll be glad to explain it more if you want to know. The U.S. food culture must change to offer hope for a future healthy population. Now, here's the headlines I want to see tomorrow. The crisis is over. U.S. diabetes rates have decreased 10% per year. Wouldn't that be nice? 2016 was a banner year because national obesity rates are now decreasing. U.S. hypertension is finally under control, and when this happens, we can all pat each other on the back. Thank you very much. Do you have some time for that? Okay. Okay, I think there's several really good questions there. One is, let me say that multiple births are interesting because twins and triplets are born smaller, but they're not programmed. So they're born smaller and controlled in a way that really doesn't increase their risk for disease very much. Secondly, premature babies are not included in the data that I showed, but they have higher risks. So the date that I, data that I showed you are term babies. Uh, lastly, have we measured the nutrient levels for different things in the blood? And the answer is there's several groups doing it. We have a study ourselves that on it, and I can't tell you very much about it yet. Hi. Um, I'm currently an OHU dietetics student, and I will say change, it seems like, within the population is kind of a hard thing to achieve. But my question to you was if the infant's genetics are determined by the grandmother, and that infant decides to live a very healthy, nutritious life, is it enough to prevent obesity and diabetes, even though those genes may not be the best set of genes, per se? That's a great question. And the answer is we don't know, but we think that most of the risk from disease vulnerability can be eradicated by a healthy lifestyle and good diet. We're pretty sure that there's some gene reversal, uh, epigenetic reversal, that we already know about. The extent to which you can completely erase it has not been determined, and I don't know the answer to that. Yes, there are several groups, uh, including one that we're working with in the Netherlands, who are looking at the role of the father. It's very clear that poor nutrition of the father can make an epigenetic effect that affects the next generation, and now it looks like the following generation. All of these epigenetic effects are, are multi-generational. They, they can be passed on to the next generation. So it looks like there's a male effect, 
and I'm just making this up now, I'm guessing that of the total effect, maybe 20 or 30 percent of it's from the male and the rest of it's from the female and the reason is that the, that the growing fetus by necessity has to get its nutrition from the mother. Yeah. Let me give you an example that is, is really profound. There is a picture, I don't have it with me, but you'll have to picture it, of a group of poor, tattered children with no shoes in London in, a, in the turn of the last century. Those children all turned out to, have, to be resistant to disease and not have heart disease. And the reason is that they came from healthy families who moved into London from the surroundings where they ate vegetables and they were healthy. They never got heart disease and neither did their children. This has been studied. But the peers around them that lived in London where nutrition was poor for the last few generations had very high rates of disease. So we know that a person's history can be passed on for quite a long time once it's healthy and the French have proven that too. They changed their diets completely at the turn of the last century by mandate from the government. Every French child was, was a healthy child, was their motto. And it turns out that that made a big difference in the health of the whole population. Thank you. Um, I've been wondering about the uh, Yeah, two, two points. I'll talk about macrosomia first. Not every baby born at nine pounds is macrosomia. It is by definition, but not by pathological designation. So there are babies even up 10 pounds who are, are pretty husky, have a lot of muscle, they're healthy, and mom complains when they come out, but otherwise they're fine. <laughs> so it turns out that you have to designate what kind of baby, a macrosomic baby you're talking about. If it has a lot of fat and low muscle mass, that's because mother's glucose is out of control, and those babies are in trouble. So that's a difference. And well, what was your first question? Oh, uh, the role of breastfeeding. Oh, yeah, the role of breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is extremely important, and we've shown that uh, some studies that we've published, and many, many other people have done so, that breastfeeding, especially in the first six months, is very good for babies because they have they get to eat a high sugar, high fat diet. That might seem counterproductive, but breast milk has the things they need for their liver to get used to metabolizing that fat. So the the milk fat that they get in breast milk is healthy and good for them and breastfeeding is, in our opinion, the best of all kinds. Thank you. And hopefully we get some hand up and get a lot of that on it. They will be coming. Great. Um, I had a situation where um, when I was pregnant with my daughter, she was born six and a half weeks premature. Yeah. Totally unexpected. I did everything with amazing nutrition and everything I could well, so it was a shock to me. Um, fortunately, I was able to have her vaginally. I know that's important for the baby. Um, and I began breastfeeding right away. She was under five pounds, had no fat on her body. Within probably, I, I, I was in a, a University of Phoenix setting on breastfeeding at the time, and I did on demand. Yeah. And within probably seven months, she looked like Laurel Hardy. She was a butterball. Yeah. Um, she has been a thin child, a normal, normal thin child her whole life. So, and we're, we're basically vegan, vegetarian, yeah. most of her life. So I'm wondering, you talked about the liver, you know, not being up to par. What kind of um, things 
do you think she would be facing? Yeah. So babies that are born prematurely, no matter uh, the circumstance, uh, are at higher risk than the population. It's just a population risk. You can't just say that that individual, we know for sure what's going to happen. It's a risk. And that would be true for your daughter. But the truth is that no one has really studied really healthy diets in these people to see how, to what degree that's reversed. And I expect most of it is. So if you had to ask me my opinion, I would, uh, I would say uh, that girl's in pretty good hands. And I breastfed us for four years. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a wonderful story. Okay. Yeah. About what? Yes, right. Yes. Right. So, yeah, I'll repeat the question. She is. She wants me to give a lecture on neurotransmitters. <laughs> So I will say this, that we know quite a bit about the effects of undernutrition on neurotransmitter expression. So each neurotransmitter has a gene that's responsible for its production, and those production rates go down, and some of those are epigenetically modified, so they're not likely to change, they won't easily change. So that's why people, and, and like the uh, the person that we just heard as an example here, many babies that are born undernourished will get fat when later. And some of that is due to the fact that their appetite is very different than it would be from another child. Now the question is, do we know whether we can change these neurotransmitters later in our lives by, by living healthy lifestyles? There's some truth to that, I'm quite sure, because almost everybody could, in this room could get up and give an example of some adult that they've met, maybe even themselves, who once ate a really poor nutritious diet and craved foods that were high sugar, high salt, and high fat, and then after a period of time became easy with good diet and highly nutritious diet, and then when they went back and tried to eat a potato chip, it didn't taste good anymore. And they have changed their preferences by changing their neurotransmitters and the way their brain works. So the brain is plastic, but the degree to which that's responsible for which neurotransmitter and how much, we have no idea. So there's a lot of work to be done on that. And by the way, you should know that we have close to 70 scientists at OHSU. They're working on these aspects, including neurotransmitters, to understand that. Can I comment on over-exercising? Yes, well, most people are worried about uh, people in our society having too little exercise, and I, I agree with that. I just saw the data this last week on how many miles the average American rides in a car per day, and it's 30. And how many hours they sit in the screen, it's eight. So it turns out that it's, we're, we're not doing exercise when we're riding in the car or looking at a screen or both at the same time. So the, the worry that we have about exercise, I want to say, is that most people need more of it. But there are people, especially when they get over 50 years old, who somehow want a new lease on life and think that exercise will bring them back the, the gift of eternal life. And so what they do is they exercise and they join marathons and things like that, and they actually, they actually harm their body by doing too much. They hurt their joints, they hurt their heart, and some of these we can show that, especially on, on excessive exercise, uh, there are proteins in the blood that came from the heart that show that they're breaking down muscle. So it's possible to over-exercise. It's very unusual. But if somebody you know is doing it, they should look carefully about what they're doing, especially if they're in the elderly category. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we know a lot about that. It turns out that exercise during pregnancy is really valuable and important unless you overdo it. So running marathons is not something I would, would recommend. But 
healthy, long walks, a lot of exercise while you're pregnant, makes bigger babies, better placentas, and it's nothing but positive. Yeah, well, it's known that breast milk is beneficial in that regard. Does everybody hear that question? No. Oh, so what she's asking is about autoimmune disease and whether breastfeeding is beneficial, right? Yeah. Cow's milk versus breastfeeding. I'll get it. So it turns out that um, I can tell you what we know and we don't know. We, we know that there's less autoimmune disease in certain in certain kinds of autoimmune disease in women who breastfeed, but we don't know very much about autoimmune disease or any immune disease with program. Of all the things I've told you about diabetes, cardi cardiovascular disease, and obesity, we know the least about the immune system and inflammatory reactions because it just has not been studied. The field hasn't been around enough. I gave a lecture two days ago in Cambridge, England, and I told them, because they're all scientists and they're all young people, I said, listen, if you want to help us, get in the laboratory and help us figure out what's going on with autoimmune disease and inflammation. We just don't know the answer. Yeah, so the question is, on the slide that I showed the developmental phases of different organs and when they're sensitive, I used the word nutrition there as a generic term, and she's wondering what that actually means. Malnutrition. Yeah. Malnutrition, yeah. So the, the, the problem is that there are many forms of malnutrition, and that's why I tried to use a generic term. We know that very low protein or very high protein diets are bad for fetuses and babies. I can give you examples if you want. We know that high fat diets that are mostly fat are bad for most babies. And any of these malnourishment events that happen during those developmental periods, whether it's continuous or for a day or two, will have some kind of an effect. So I am only talking about this now in general terms, and it's very difficult to be specific you know, in a, in a, in a particular case. But to give you the concept that nutrition is important for the development of these organs at specific times. Way back there. This being a vegetarian conference, do you have data to show that babies born from vegetarians or vegans are, are larger or healthier? I do not, but I suspect that they are. <laughs> Way back there. Well, when I give a talk like this, I try to say things that I have a lot of data to back it up. And so some of the things that I suspect, I don't really say much about because I'm not sure and I'm waiting for data. And that's an example that you've just given. It turns out that I suspect that food sensitivities are programmed. There's no hard evidence that that's true. And that needs to be looked at. And I'm especially interested in the number of people who are sensitive to gluten, for example. Now, one of the interesting things about the gluten story is that gluten is a protein, and if you're not allergic to it, if, I, if you don't mind me using that word, generic term, well, then it shouldn't matter whether you eat gluten-free or not, but it does. A lot of people who go on gluten-free diets are not, they don't have celiac disease, but they feel better when they eat gluten-free. And I think the reason for that is that the that most of the food that you buy that has gluten in it is overprocessed. So those people are all benefiting from getting rid of all that processed food. So I have a feeling like that's the biggest reason. 
But I don't have hard data to back up that point either. I'm giving you my opinion now, which I hope you think is right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, one more question. Yeah. So can we explain anything by epigenetics and miscarriages? First of all, you should know that there is a genetic tendency for miscarriages, and uh, my colleagues in Australia have shown that that can be also passed on through the male. So that's one thing. The epigenetic part of it hasn't been looked at, but the Australian group that I just referred to is studying it, and I'm guessing that within five years, if you'll ask me that question, I will give you data to answer. That's about where we are. Thank you all. You've been a wonderful audience.